All right, well, thank you, bright and early. <laughs> I feel I should have had like a bagels or something because you're, thank you so much for coming so early, walks a mile to get here. I know some, I'm sorry. <laughs> they come from South Africa, so we had them, they come from far, we had to make it that far. So I'm, I'm very grateful today to have uh, two folks from uh, Standard Bank from South Africa. You're gonna see they had um, such amazing content that we decided to, uh, spend the hour with them. And we're going to go over many things today. Uh, they're going to introduce themselves, we're going to look over the architecture, and we're going to talk about their center of excellence, which, were, which is amazing, the things they've done. They're going to share some of their recipe for success and how they build a community. But first, maybe you guys should introduce yourself. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Werner Lowe. So uh, hopefully the teleprompter or whatever you know, picks up my accent. but. Uh, I've been working for Standard Bank for the past 12 years. I started out as a SQL consultant, and I ended up getting my passion for BI. I joined Permanent around 2011, and since then I've rolled out self-service. I've created a center of excellence around BI, and now we're looking after the BI platforms. And then with me on the stage, uh, I've got Tian. Hi, um, so yeah, I'm Tian Taliard. I, I've been in financial analytics from the start, so I was doing a more financial analysis on, on project management. And then by doing all the, the financial analytics, I started enjoying automation a bit more, so I joined the BI club and I started doing BI development. And then I joined the Center of Excellence team to set up platforms for the organization rather than focus on specific app development. And that's what I've been up to. And yeah. the latest role on this, sorry, is the Cognitive services, which is the new role that I've been moved into at the bank to look after cognitive services, AI services to set up a platform. And, and you guys have the best pictures. Yeah, this is no, actually, no. one is when you, you were getting married and the other one, yeah. right, is, those are the marriage pictures, right? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah so yeah. we're married now. No. Not, not, <laughs> <laughs> that, I didn't say that, you said no. Okay. But it's true, when I saw it, it's spectacular. Thanks, man. All right, but tell us a bit more about Standard Bank, because that's also spectacular. Okay. Um, well, who of you know Standard Bank? Anybody? Oh, awesome. Actually, so a lot of people. So, well, Standard Bank's the largest bank in uh, Africa by assets. Um, we're one of the biggest uh, banks in South Africa. Um, ICBC's got a 20.1% stake, stake in Standard Bank. Um, 20 different countries, we've got quite a few ATMs, a lot of uh, customers. But the most important thing for me is that we've got more than 150 years of history. So as you can imagine, it's, a, it's a, quite a turnaround on any BI strategy because you're sitting with legacy um, applications, legacy data sets, uh, legacy mindsets. So that is something uh, you know, quite, quite difficult to turn around. And yeah, that's in a nutshell what Standard Bank does with a financial services organization, with retail customers and uh, you know, corporate investment banking as well. Incredible history. So tell us exactly what you guys do at, at Standard Bank. Uh, at Standard Bank or in the center of excellence? In the center of excellence in Standard Bank. Okay, so basically, um, if I can put it simply at a, at a base what we do, it's like, if, if you imagine a car, you know, if the car doesn't drive, then all the fancy features such, such as a sunroof, a window, sat nav, that doesn't mean anything. So what we do is we make the car drive. We make sure that we've got platforms that's always available, that, uh, you know, business can use seamlessly, that, um, that they just can have a good experience with. So a couple of the things that we focus on are things like stability. Uh, we have to make sure that we monitor the platform sufficiently and make sure that, uh, that it's available at any given time, that the business have a good experience. We do the security. Um, being a financial services organization, if we don't have sufficient security on our data, we'll be in big trouble. We need to know who's accessing which data at, uh, at any given time as well. Licensing, we have to proactively uh, check our licensing uh, to make sure that we, we're ready for scale. So. Um, we're m more proactive than reactive in that front. Uh, we need to make sure that anybody can access our platforms. R&D and expert guidance, they go hand in hand. We need to know on any of our platforms what's, what's new in any, any uh, version release, any patch, any, um, 
anything that's coming down the line, so any new capabilities as well. So our team really needs to be the best of the best in the organization. We need to be able to field any business query at any given time and make sure that you know, we can assist them. Because if we can't assist them, then uh, you know, they have to go find somebody, somebody else who can. So we'd rather prefer they take guidance from us than from, from the finding answers themselves. So 15 people supporting 20,000 users? Yes. That's a uh, that's significant impact. And you talked a little bit about 150 years old company, lots of challenges, and those, uh, you have a lot of BI challenges that are related to yes. that legacy. So I think most of the challenges that, that we experienced was legacy. It's uh, because we, we, we used to support on-prem on -prem infrastructure for our BI solutions, which we still do. So some of them, just to highlight a couple, is like server patches. We'll come in on a Monday morning, realize our platforms are all down. And then they, we find out that we, there were server patches applied over the weekend, you know, and uh, security patches or Windows patches, or whatever the case may be, that didn't work with our platforms. So then we have to react. Um, we've got dependencies on too many teams in the organization as well. Uh, like, for example, the network teams, the storage teams, security teams. So whenever we apply any change, we have to go, you know, down the line and wait for availability. And, you know, it's, it's not really efficient. Uh, things like uh, technical debt and inadequate skill levels. So now you take somebody from a traditional reporting tool and you put them on self-service. So, you know, where somebody used to rely on IT to create the BI for them, we now have to do that. They do it for themselves. So you'll obviously get some issues where somebody doesn't understand SQL or how to now work with their new data. So then, but we, we went from the stance that, you know, let them create the value. We know we're going to incur technical debt. Let's fix that uh, retrospect. We'll fix that uh, going forward. Um, multiple data sources, that's also always an issue. And uh, BI funding, you know, that's, that's always a bottleneck in we, you know, where we come from. You know, business always want the value, but they don't want to pay for the value up front. Um, can I talk about the solution? Yes, that's it. Why? So we'll it's go just back. Not power BI. No. It's also the, the power platform in general, yes. right? The, the power platform in general as well. So the solution on the previous slide that we, um, that we found fit was going cloud because cloud takes uh, away all of, all of the, 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 most of the challenges that we faced. You know, the infrastructure, we don't have to look, all, you know, look at the infrastructure anymore. We don't have all those dependencies. It's taking out all the noise that we used to experience. But I can actually would like to add a few things here. So the, we came, like this, uh, the whole platform allows a whole new concept around what we can offer the users. We used to only give like a single BI solution to visualize data, but now they can actually go ahead and add business. Like, I wish I could explain this as well as James Phillips did yesterday, but that's the kind of the idea, the power platform idea inside on Azure and the extra functionalities that it offers. It, it got us, our users so excited to see what, they, that the, what the abilities are, the capabilities are with the, the power platform. And, uh, and also, because it being cloud-based, in the, in the past we had to go and install a, a, an application, we had to upskill, but because uh, you know, users can access Power BI and the Power Platforms, you know, uh, anybody can access it. And also because it is of uh, Microsoft, so most people are used to Excel, most people are used to Word, so you know, the transition from, from what they used to do onto modern platforms it was, was uh, insignificant actually. So we're going to talk a little bit about your architecture um, in, in general. And what, for me, the thing that is so interesting is what's in the middle on top, that, the teams. But yeah. also all the components around is amazing. So the approach we took of architecture was we, we wanted to find a, a different mechanism to get our users um, aware of the technology that we want to launch throughout the organization. So I'll split this slide up into two halves, right? So the top half is the architecture used for the community, the users, developers, right? And the bottom half is data. So we've got a big, we've got a lot of data throughout the organization and we had to figure out a way, how do we channel the data so that we know what's happening inside our data landscape? Because we decided to, so let me take the top off. We, I'll go into each of these components that we used in later slides in the demo and actually show you guys what we, how we used all of these features. But the idea was that we can create a community where everybody can ask everybody questions. So being a center of excellence, if we get all the questions, we never get time to explore new features, right? So we wanted to channel them to each other 
so that we can create awareness on new features. The bottom half is the gateway. So our approach was to create two gateways. The, so to explain from our term, as we created an enterprise gateway to monitor the, the enterprise assets. So this would be like the, the governed and checked data sources, the, the ones that control the organization or checks that we perceive to, to have. And then the productivity gateway was everything else. So the reason for the productivity was so that we don't stifle any business growth, so that everybody can explore the new values and the, the new tools that's available, and we can monitor what, I, what the data sources they use on this gateway so that once we want to move them over to an enterprise source, we can, and we've got awareness of all the data. So uh, maybe we'll take a question. Usually we don't do that, mm. but we have a bit okay. of time. So the question is, do you use uh, Power Query uh, in, within uh, Excel as well? The Power Query, Power Pivot. Yeah, so we, we've actually got so many users across the organization. I'm sure somewhere somebody uses, but it's not something that we uh, emphasize on to tell them to use. Mm -hmm. yeah. We mostly want them to focus on the actual BI tool itself, so it keeps everything inside the BI landscape, Power BI, and then connect to the data sources straight where they can. But we don't stop them if they want to use it. We want the users to actually just bring creativity, we'll make sure the platform is ready. Mm. And th th that's actually really what we do is we're saying, we'll give you um, a couple of platforms, you use what's gonna be, um, you know, what you're most comfortable with and we'll support that. We'll make sure that we've, we cover all angles, the governance, the expert knowledge on those platforms. And you'll see, we're gonna go into detail, but what, I'm, what I was really impressed in preparing this, pr this presentation is the focus on the top half as well. It's not just building an amazing platform, but Teams and, and YouTube and, and Sway, you'll see in detail the effort they went into communicating that to the, to the users, and you will see that it showed. And so all of that, because you had uh, strong basics, you were able to bring a lot of the latest capabilities to the users, yes. right? So by taking out the, the mundane, you know, like my server is down, we've got a problem with the networks, we've got a, you know, a, a slow response times. By taking out that noise, the team could actually focus on, you know, what is the added value benefits of, of the platforms. So we could go into, you know, a couple of them, smart alerts and subscriptions. That was something uh, brand new to the, our business users. So they can be triggered, uh, certain events in their data will trigger alerts on their phones. So, you know, they don't actually have to go into the dashboard and go find stuff. They will actually be, be alerted when something happens. Things like um, mobile BI. So they don't actually, as I mentioned, have to go and in front of their laptop. They can sit in a meeting and go and analyze their data. Uh, advanced data science and cognitive AI. So this also opens up the, the door for our business users to actually get into that whole machine learning data science world. For them, they, they still think it's a, you know, some center of excellence that does that, but they now realize that, well, I can do this myself. So the added value benefit, added, we actually, we, we, became, we became evangelists. We just learn the new features when we go and present it to business and they use it. So it really creates a lot of excitement rather than there's a report. That's so. right. And, and you can see over time that the usage has grown and has been correlated to the introduction of yeah. those features, right? Yes. So what, we, what this slide actually shows is that you know, we, we separated purposefully between blue and green. Blue is the legwork that we did up front, setting up the platform, and the green is the added value, the value added stuff that we did. So, as you can see, we started in 2017 by coming here to, um, to um, the insights, and we came here to learn. Two years later, we can actually show what, what happened from us coming here and learning. So, we started our Power BI journey in 2017. And we, we did a lot, of late, uh, a lot of work on setting up the platforms. And as the user adoption uh, grew, we, we actually started gaining, uh, by putting in the hard work immediately, right from the beginning, we can actually, you know, uh, our cadence around delivering new features increased rapidly as, long as, as well as our uh, uh, user uptake because they got the excitement, they, they had a stable platform, they can get insights whenever they want on their mobile, they get smart alerts, they, get, they, get, they can use NLP to get, so the whole hype became quite significant. And as the, the, the usage increased, our velocity increased as well. And to, if I can add there, so it was twofold of excitement, right? So 
being a traditional center of excellence, we always, always had to do server maintenance. And that's not a lot of fun to wake up at 8 in the morning to run in and go re reboot the server and get f figure out what patch caused what. So by doing this legwork and trying to, to, keep, to make sure that this platform is secure and getting everybody on board, we could focus on these features that also excites us. So if we follow the trend, and this was also a full-time job just to follow Microsoft Power BI releases every month. I think there's like 30 to 40 releases. It's every month we lock down and we had to figure that out. But doing that, we, we learned a lot around what is available in tech. And that's a lot of excitement for us as a central team as well. That's right. And here we can see that there's a lot of people using Power BI, right? Yep. So that's the usage. So that's two years ago when we came to Data Insight Summit. That was 2017. Then 2018 we launched, we had about 300 uh, unique users a month, and it like steeply increased. The, the dip you see there is just December month when everybody's at the coast, but then, then it increased again when Jan, when the guys came back into the office. So, but we have a lot of users, so with over 20 countries, which is, which is awesome. So, and as we get to the community, we'll show how these 20 countries can collaborate with each other by using that architecture we've shown for the, the community. I, I do want to add on that 6,500 users it may, doesn't, may not sound significant, but if you think it's only within Standard Bank, it's not external to, you know, to customers as yet. So this is actually in terms of uh, employees, and that's a unique user. So if you would access the dashboard once, it will you know, count you for one for that period of time. So you know, that it's actually a significant amount of users that we have. No, I can confirm it's significant. So, <laughs> so we're going to now go into the details of what exactly did you mm. do uh, to drive usage and adoption uh, of RIS. So we're going to go over all the different components. Can you go over them? And the next uh, 40 minutes, we'll go over each component. And we'll actually, you guys will show demo Definitely and all nice. of that. So it's going to get, they're going to share their recipe, so to yeah. speak, right? So yeah. to add, so what we, what we did was we decided, okay, we've got this new platform that's available. How do we tackle it to make sure that it's robust and stable for the whole organization to use? So our approach was we, we could actually, but this is not retrospective. We didn't know this at the start. So looking back, this is the, the blocks that we worked on. So we focused on what's the components inside the architecture. We looked at securing the platform, the tenant settings. The amazing part about the securing the platform is all toggle buttons, which is different to what we were used to. And then licenses, we had to understand all the different licenses. Um, team setup, gateway setup, and then Power BI training. But I'll go into the, the in more detail now with each one. So you're going to go first with the Power BI component, right? Yes. And so uh, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so components we split into three sections. So because we have all these different data sources available and we created the two gateways, we, we knew that we, we need a tool that can actually cater for data import and can do some modeling. And Power BI did offer a lot of that capabilities for us. So that was the, the first section we, we created. The, the middle one is where the users come in. So instead of focusing on what developers need, we decided to focus on what the users want, right? So they are the ones that's analyzing the data. So we, we decided that they, they need features that actually allows them to get extra insights. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, do you mind speaking? This is your uh, link between your three big gateways that you put together at the bottom. Uh, if you populate some of the, uh, let's call it single source and two cloud data into the productivity side, or how does that relationship? Do you mind repeating the question? Oh, I can. So when it comes to the split between our two gateways, the enterprise gateway and the productivity space, did we create the data sets up front, or the connections up front? Is that the question? Yes, yeah. But uh, I'll specifically, when you think of the traditional uh, uh, warehouses, um, I'm assuming that's, not, that's the, the enterprise. Yeah. And the other one is more of a base-end yes. style area. Yes. Do you need to mix the, the types of that? Um, Yes, I, I believe there will be some data duplication across, but I think Tian will cover a, a slide specific around the gateway setups. So how we did the gateways, if I, I'll, I'll get to a gateway slide. Should I, if, if it doesn't answer it, then can we, is that okay? okay? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, yeah. So to continue on the, the middle component, that section that we created on the service, this is where we followed the releases and made sure that our users are aware of all the, the, the latest things that's available 
like subscriptions, the, the custom visuals that th that's available to use, get, get onto alerts, like set their own alerts on the, the data that they want to get triggered by. We, the Power BI mobile, um, the embedding. So there's a lot of features that we actually had to be aware of. And then the, the biggest one that created the excitement was AI. So AI is the topic of the town now. So everybody wants AI. And then we realized by, by truly diving into the AI components that's already available in Power BI, you, you'll realize that there's a lot of AI that you're already doing without knowing. By just looking at the NLP components, like by asking a question on your data, by, by doing the recommendation apps inside Power BI Home. So it's nothing that we do, it's Microsoft offers this, that you get recommendations on your apps. We, we also got the quick insights that you can write, you can just click on your data set, ask for quick insights, and it generates like insights on your data. The analyze increase and de decrease was a good find that got our finance team very excited by right clicking and explaining an increase or decrease. And then key influencers, so we're not yet using HoloLens, but we, we are aware and we want to find the, the use cases for that. But that was the exciting part, like truly diving into those components. That's right. And being in financial services, obviously securing the platform was the second most important thing after the mm. first one, right? Definitely. So we realized today that because we roped in the right people in the organization, like our security team, this helped us a lot for the future uses of Power BI. We got them involved. We, we actually dove into every single component of Power BI inside the tenant settings that's, that we can change. And we went through it one by one to say what fits to our policy. And then we adjusted the security settings to that. And then from there, we could actually say that this, the platform is secure. The only thing that's left is to make sure your data is allowed. Because we in South Africa, cross-border regulations and compliance is the, is, the, is the other issue, but that's the only issue now because we've secured the platform. Got it. And so now a topic, and then you're going to start showing us some things, mm. uh, you, you know, talking about a bit about li licensing. Yeah. So. We truly had to understand the licensing, licensing before rolling it out to the organization, right? We, we broke it, but the, this is the known licensing that's available. There's the free licenses that's part of your Office 365 E3 and up. And then there's pro licenses and then Power BI Premium. So we wanted to understand where do we use which license, right? So we, we opened free licenses for the entire organization so that everybody can explore their data by themselves. So that's for self-exploring of data and publishing to their, their own personal workspaces and getting it available on their mobiles. This was so that everybody can get used to the tool and without us having to go and train everyone. And we'll only train once the questions comes in and then we get them onto our community. The Power BI Pro licenses, the slide after this is actually the role. So, but the Pro license was for the champions, the guy, the authors, and the contents. And I'll show you how we split up the roles within the organization after this slide. And then, when do we use premium? Now, the one thing that we've learned on premium that is very important for us as a center of excellence was we, we used to think that it's mainly you have to do like a one-to-one -one on Pro license versus when do you pay for premium. But premium actually offers a lot more functionality so there's a lot of stuff within the premium capacity that's not available in the pro license space. Like the incremental refreshes, there's integration with cognitive services, you get into data flows, you can use auto ML capabilities. That, so it's a different concept when you think, okay, so it's not a one-to-one -one with pro licenses, you actually have to outweigh those pro, the, the pros and cons, right? Well, it's mostly pros. Yeah, you know. maybe mention about the pu publishing as well. The sharing of reports. Yeah, and premium allows you to, I don't know if you guys know, but you, it allows you to share with free users. So as soon as you assign something to a premium capacity, free users can view that content. And then they also get the benefit of the premium features. So well, you initially, we, we started and we thought we had now had to go by, you know, for like tons of licenses, right. but it ended up not, be, not, not being the case. So we actually saved quite a, an, a significant amount of money as well. So you're going into Teams now? Yes. Tell us what you are showing us. Okay, so this is our team site that I showed you guys where we use all the different Office 365 products to engage with our community. We created channels to, to kind of lead them towards what they need. The, the, the discussion we just had was about licensing, so I would take you to the licensing channel. Within this channel, you'll see that most of the questions actually just is, can I get a license? But it, it actually, it started off with, I, I want a license, and today it's, we, I need a license. But so 
how we manage the, the licensing is we created this channel where we explain what the licenses are. So we give the users an explanation of free licenses. There's actually a free pro trial available for them to explore pro features without us starting the, giving them a pro license. And then there's the pro license. The, the next one, we added a tab to explain the data policy within. So actually, in a nutshell, what that shows is that you're accountable for the data that you import and the data that you publish. We, we want our users to have the power to, to use the, the tools without stopping them through certain checks, right? And the last one is a Power App that we created for license manage management. We, as the Power BI service administrators, do not have access as global tenants on Azure. So we can't assign the pro licenses. That's the reason for creating the, the Power App, to get all the requests. So, so you have, this is a Power App inside Teams, right? It's Teams that we embedded. So you can come in, the users will see the different licenses that they can request. They'll say, I want to request a pro license. Then we explain Power BI licensing. They'll select the request for a pro license. And then we created a form to get a bit of information around the use case. So we wanted to know what data are you connecting to? How many people do you want to share with? Have you tried other BI tools? Just getting a bit of information around the, the use case that the team has. Once they submit the form, we let me just jump back here. Yeah, maybe if you can just uh, type a couple of test data so they can see that it actually t checks the, the, bar, the radius green to make sure that they fill in all the fields. Yeah, we made all the fields mandatory so I can show. And so at the end where they are done, it says, uh, yeah, so you got it. So as soon as you type it in, it turns green just to illustrate to the users that they need to fill in all the fields. So they'll type in the data sources. They'll say that I've never tried a tool. We actually also created a T's and C's. Now this helps us to, they have to agree to the policy around data usage. So this gives us an audit trail that the users do know that they are accountable for the data that they publish. If they aren't, if they don't know, we, we're the broker to the compliance teams. So we'll have them speak to the right privacy and compliance teams before using the data. So if you accept, now you're hooked. Okay, so then confirm that once you submit, as a team we get the, the requests list where we can classify the the source so that we know whether it's enterprise data or productivity data that links to our gateways, and we can approve or reject the request. That's amazing. And, and all of this, obviously, it's low, no code, and it's a, it has a Lego-like capability bringing power apps inside Teams. It's just just a plug. It just, it's seamless. Yeah, it's seamless. It's very easy. You actually just add an app. It's, it's yeah, exactly. very easy to do. It's the same as Power BI. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So um, we talked uh, a lot about users throughout this uh, conversation. Can you tell us more about uh, your, your users? Yes, so this is where we split the roles throughout the organization. We, we decided to split it up into Power BI champions, us as admin, and then the viewers, and then what, what they need to do within the landscape. Um, Power BI champions, they are accountable for the content creation and publishing. So they're the ones that create, that publish, and they manage the security and the data that goes in. The, the admins, that's us, the center of excellence, I had to make sure that we've got more items on, the, on this presentation so that we can seem like we do more. <laughs> but we manage the tenant settings, we do the licensing, we manage the gateway requests. So um, the fun part is the awareness. So we started doing knowledge sharing sessions as well where we can actually have a session on Teams and get everybody invited onto one team session and we can share the latest features. It's a lot of fun to do when, when something is released, get our users excited as well. Then for the viewers, it is um, viewing the data so, and using the commentary, using the alerts. So it's similar to the, the, the previous slide, but so that's their role yep. in this. So we've talked about four things, the, the components, securing the platform, the license usage, this is now the, the teams. And now it's only here that you're really uh, focusing on the gateway, right? Yes. So for gateway requests, we, we also created a Power App so that we do not have to give everybody admin rights on the portal to create connections. We, we have them request the connection, and then we analyze the actual request and then create the, the connections for them. 
we, we split it up into that enterprise and productivity like we mentioned. And then as time elapsed, we, we realized that the countries are starting to get on board and they also want gateways. So we decided we're going to do a gateway per country as well. So the third one there on the left screen that you would see is Namibia that just got a gateway recently. Angola is coming up next. So by creating this, we get a good view of all the country's data sources that they use so that we can rather add people as users than creating a new connection. And I'm hoping that answers towards the duplication of, of the data to yeah. know that what, the, what, what is available within the gateways. So I also want to add on to that. So what this does, it, it actually creates visibility of what data is in the organization. In the past, people will use a, a BI tool to connect to a specific data set and it'll be invisible. With us managed this cent centrally, uh, we can actually see what, what data sets are pe what people are creating, to, uh, connecting to. We also were quite deliberate with splitting it between enterprise data sets and productivity sets. For example, we've got like 5,000 SQL data marts in the organization, you know, but we don't know what's being used and what's not being used. By doing this, we can actually, even though it doesn't solve the problem necessarily, we, we've got visibility of all the data marts that people are connecting to. Then they would ask the question, but why, do, why is there an enterprise data gateway? Then we can explain to them that we've got a, a strategic, strategic objectives in the organization with our data, and these are the ones that you should be connecting to. So by you connecting to a productivity data set, you are actually, you know, you're doing so yourself a disservice because you're not using approved organizational data sets. But it, it has got benefits on the other side as well. For example, let's say you've, uh, you're just doing data discovery or you've got your own mod mar for specific reasons. So, but we didn't want to say, this is the only data set that you, you should be, you can connect to, because then that, that you, you, you're taking away creativity that way as well. So you're gonna show it to us, right? Yes. I actually think we missed the one portion of the demo it's for the team set up back to the previous roles. If I can just quickly yeah, take ahead, you guys ahead. through that as well. So what we created here is a, a channel for team setup, publishing, and how to share content so that we explain to our users what's the steps to get your data onto Power BI and on, out for your users. And in here, we, we, we used Sway to create a document. So within Sway, we've got a, a publishing Power BI content. And throughout this document, it takes you step by step on signing in. Let me just scroll down so you guys get an idea. With screenshots from desktop, sign into the service, link to your app's workspaces. Once you hit publish, you'll, you'll see the app's workspaces that's available from, from your personal profile. And then getting it onto, well, if you do not have an app workspace, we also take them through creating an app's workspace. It's amazing how you use all the different components effectively. So now you're integrating Sway into Teams yes, to describe. Yeah. And then editing the workspace, adding security. So we kind of give them a good overview of what is available and what they are accountable for as a, a Power BI champion. The, the second step is not everybody likes to read or likes to view a Sway document. So we also embedded um, YouTube videos that explains through a visual for the guys that just wants to view and see what's the difference between Power BI files, uh, PBIX files and apps. And then everybody probably knows Guy in a Cube. And we, we use a lot of their videos inside our, our channels to kind of train our users on what's the difference between apps and workspaces. And so this gives them a good idea. And this is very clever because you don't have to recreate certain videos. If you, have, if you see videos, you can use Steam and embed them inside uh, natively. Uh, and, and our software enables you to do that Lego-like approach. Then we created the app. So this is Gateway and a, a premium assignment request that we receive from our Power BI champions. Now, so this is when somebody wants to request a, a Gateway or a premium, is that the, the yes. other? Okay. So if a Power BI champion is ready to share his content, he wants to request assignment onto the, the premium capacity. We, the reason we use a Power App for this is, previously we gave all the Power BI champions assignment rights on the premium capacities, and that did not work out well, because we, we soon found that we've got 80 developers throughout the organization, and everybody's publishing to everybody, and everybody needs premium. So as soon as we hit capacity, we've got no clue around what's happening and why. 
So now we thought, okay, let's channel it through an app so that we can monitor what they need, what they need and want to do. So within this requesting assignment rights, we ask a few questions around how many people do you want to share with, um, how big is the data sets going to be, give us the workspace name and the actual sources as well. Then once the, the workspace is on premium capacity, they are able to share with their free users. Then now they need to automate the reload, right? So the refresh so that they don't have to refresh inside PBIX files and publish every day. They want to automate through the gateway and the on-premise sources. So we also created then an application for them to request the, the data, the gateways, the gate, gateway connections that they need. And in this, we, we want to know who's the database owner, um, what's the connection type, so to actually know do you need a intraday, an import, or a live type of connection. We wanted to know what's the actual server name, and we followed an approach that every connection uses a service account, so we don't add user profiles to them. Then we also want an AD security group that manages their users. Now with this, we can give the Power BI champion the accountability to add extra developers. So then at this point, we step back. We create the connection once, and then we step back, and they manage it further. This also allows us to, to add governance in future. So if we, if we decide we need uh, certain classifications or whatever, we can just add it to that and make it compulsory. So we kind of enforce governance this way as well. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And I think you did the gateway not at the very beginning to enable people to be creative, right, and, and play with it. And once they're ready, let's make it secure. Let's do the gateway. Yes. So how, what, that's honestly true because we, we found that people... We let them explore with the sources that they have access to. As soon as they want to automate, they have to get a gateway. And we're the only team that could, can create gateways, so they do come to us then. Then we can assist them with the proper mechanisms to automate the data, because you can't automate on a folder without creating these gateways. We, we do not um, tell the users to, to use personal gateways in the organization. We mainly focus on enterprise gateways. Got it. And obviously, this is the last component. Training is a big deal, and you already talked a lot about it. Tell us a bit more about the kind of trainings you do. Yes, yeah, so training is when Power BI is easy enough for a lot of the guys to, to explore and use. This is for the truly advanced guys that wants to, to learn more. So we, we decided, how do we train them in the best way from, um, to, so to create the awareness of the features and the technical capabilities that they require? So what we used was the team site, so within that team site is where the guys ask each other questions on development. Guys would post a screenshot of the, the issue they have. It's, it's, it's very similar to the Power BI community. They actually post a screenshot, ask a question, and then somebody within the organization will, will answer them or set up a session to help them. Then, then we started using um, EDX. We found that EDX, the training that's done, I think it's by Will and Amanda, like the, the EDX program, that's the best one we found out there online. And online training, in our perspective, of, well, our opinion of it is better than classroom training for me personally, and that's what I tell people to do because you can go onto the online material whenever you can, so and when you need it. Previously, if I did classroom training, it's one week of learning everything, and then it's six months later you need it, right? So then it's forgotten. So online training is what we tell people so that they have access to the stuff at any given point. Then guided learning, actually what you can access through your Power BI desktop um, app. There's a guided learning link under the help um, tab. But we also embedded that in the Teams, and I'll show you the, the channel as well. Then last, the, the, this is about three, four months ago, we started a stream channel. So where we do the online team sessions, and we record these sessions where we take the guys through all the different features that we think is the best video for the week or the month. We're currently doing it monthly, so that channel is where we store all these data, all the learnings. So you're going to show it again? Yeah. So, so switch machine. Now you have your machine on screen. So under the training channel, we, we get people asking questions like you can see, um, posting all the different questions that they have and development that they need assistance with. Then we, we found this gem um, in, on the internet. I can't remember. I, I wish I could actually th thank the person that created this, but this allows our users to explore all the different DAX formulas that's out there. So whatever you want to do, if you want to do a filter function, it actually lists the DAX that's available for filter functions. So we, we direct our, our developers to come here when they have DAX issues. 
Then the second tab is guided learning, like I showed you guys, where we've embedded the link to the actual guided learning site. We've, oh, sorry, if you guys wanted to take a picture, I'll go back. Good. Then Power BI EDX, this is the, like, this is the best training that I've gone through. It, it truly, they keep it up to date. It's always the latest features for you, and we, we learned a lot through this course. This is the one that I did first before doing any platform work. I did this training. Um, then I started doing a video of the week. So I explore the YouTube and the internet to find the best training videos that has just been released. I put it into the team site. It's, it's kind of manual because I have to do this every week, but it ended up being monthly and sometimes weekly. It's like when I get time. But this helped a lot for the, a lot of the users because not everybody is as excited as I am around the new release, right? So <laughs> I had to kind of create that. Then our stream channel. This is interesting because I don't know if many people use stream inside Teams to advocate Power BI features. Yes, yeah. So what we did is, if we have enough time, I would have played this video for my presentation. But um, we, we've done two. Uh, tr stream videos up to date where we had around 150 odd people around the organization on a Teams call where we explained all the NLP features that's available in Q&A and also ask a question. And from that session, we had people really and truly using Q&A and kind of the, the, even the Power BI champions started developing towards Q&A. And I think the format is so nice how you see each, uh, each video independently. Any other demo that you have that you want to share? Yeah, so some of the extra stuff that we, data science is new, but we created channels for this to kind of start publishing all the AI components into this channel so that we can share that knowledge with all our different Power BI champions throughout the organization. DevOps has, has not reached any, or did not reach anything yet in, the, in our organization with Power BI, but we do want to find version control and give the guys the capability to do proper version control with their development. Um, and then embedding channels. So a lot of guys would like to embed. Most of our people that does embedding is within SharePoint and in team sites. We, and like very few inside their own sites that they create. Because, because we're not doing external Power BI to external clients yet. It's mostly internal. Got it. And lastly, so it's not the most exciting view, but I, I try to find all the Power BI gems. So these are the, the stuff that I get mostly excited about, and I want the users to know about these features that's available inside Power BI. And I started creating a wiki page with these, and I, I tried to get everybody to add features, but so far it's been only me. Um, <laughs> but there's... You will see. Once you build it, they will come. <laughs> yes. yeah. It takes a while. So stuff like analyze, increase, and decrease was a good one. So what I do is give a brief description and I give them a link to more information. Um, and then all the gems that I, I thought was really well valuable. Organized. And then usage stats. So this is where we embed a Power BI dashboard that we've created for the developers to see who uses their applications. Because everybody wants to publish something that's used. Right? Nobody wants to share something with no one. You want to you get your name out there. So I give them the opportunity from our logs to, to view there's a question at the end. Maybe we can take it. So the question is, how many champions and are they self-anointed or you know? Yeah. So we 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 follow the self-anointed route. So. We, we've got, there's another team that's also presenting at the conference just after us on Power Apps. So they, they really assisted, uh, assisted us with creating awareness of the Office 365 products that's available. And this was campaigning throughout the organization. By having sessions with all the, the various business units, we, we showed them what's available. And then the person that's most excited about the new features are usually the one that becomes the Power BI champion and the Power Apps developer then they'll request the license, and then from there we, we take them through all the different components that's available. I also want to add on, I, I think there's a, a large component about, about, around self-gratification, or I don't know what, how, what the proper term is, but you see people, normal everyday people that create dashboards, 
they start to contribute on the sites. If they see a question, they go and research and answer it. And they, you know, they, they kind of get that warm and fuzzy feeling of I'm helping people, I'm actually building myself mm. up. So we've seen a couple of them around the organization. They just start being, you know, they respond to any questions, they see if they can help. But I do think what is important is to have somebody um, like a Tian that, you know, they, they have that passion to actually deliver on this. If you have somebody with that, that doesn't have a passion as a champion, then I, I think you're going nowhere because then you'll just have another product. Yep. It's a very good point. I think most of them are self-anointed. And when you do one thing out of a group of 10, there's always one or two that is excited. That becomes your champion. It's organic and, and it works usually well. And just to add to the second part of your question, they're not the technical um, historic developers. It was mostly business teams. So it was the actual financial analysts. It was the, the guys working in the tax teams. It was people that, that they, they did not do your formal SQL, SSIS, SSRS, SSAS training. It was only the business side. And then what we found was through the marketing, soon, and like it was a really a steep increase, as we were walking through the corridors and looking through the meeting windows, there was people standing and presenting their Power BI dashboards in a lot of the sessions. And it was always the business team that's not technical. Yep. And so, yeah, go ahead. You wanted to show us some of the Power BI? Yeah, so this is the, the usage stats. We figured that we have too many workspaces for this visual, so I need my storytelling to be upskilled. Um, <laughs> well, you need, the, maybe there's a champion who can help you. Yeah, I hope so. Then, um, yeah, so throughout this application, there's a, a space for them to, to, to come and find uh, who's, who's viewing what. So we created this nice view to see which are the leading app workspaces that's sharing the most with yeah. the most users. So we try and give, we, we want to find swag to give them and kind of drive the adoption and like the competitive nature through the, yeah. between the teams and make it fun. They really get excited about, wow, look at all my, my dashboard's being, actually being used. Mm. So. And we integrated this, the, the usage logs with our, uh, like, um, we'd call it HR data, but only the, the departments that they're from, the lines of business and like a bit more information so that we can see which teams are adopting the, the fastest. And lastly, I would like to show you guys a, a form that, that we created. So this is now to, to kind of, this helps us with the BI funding part, right? So we, we get the champions to fill this in and explain what value they have created inside Power BI. So they can come and explain and describe the, what they've solved. Um, are they doing quicker reporting? Are they making better decisions? We also have a group strategy within Standard Bank that we, we want to make sure that people are aware of. So how much do they align to the group strategy and which components are they contributing to? And then give us an idea about if, if you could, this is always the hard part, and people are not keen to say how much they've saved, but if they can quantify the amount, we, we ask them to add a, a value in because that, that helps us to go into the the funding sessions and say, we've already saved a million, can I get 100,000? Like yeah, it helps and it's, it's not compulsory, but, but uh, yet we've been getting a ton of responses on this. So people actually go in, they want to show um, this is the value that we've created. Beautiful. So we're going to then with probably the most important part in how 10, 15 people were able to support 20,000, and a lot of it is around yeah. your approach to community. Yep, yeah. and I think uh, as a, the, the, the response to the question earlier, you suddenly you get people helping each other. In the past, we had one team that had to answer the entire organization's questions. And um, now we, I think on the next slide, but now on the, we suddenly have an entire community from different people, technical people, business people, um, you know, office assistants creating insights. So, you know, it really took uh, the pressure of us from having to respond to, you know, 15,000 people. Now we just have to respond to, you know, a couple of people. This is how we got to, to do the features rather than answer. Because what, what happened at, as, a, at a, as a center of excellence was by answering all the questions, we answered old questions, if that makes sense. So we're helping them with creating a pie chart rather than helping them with creating a key influences chart, right? So we had to get some of the questions to each other so that we can get them on those, those new technologies. And you would see that we've got policemen asking sailors questions. <laughs> and we are, so everybody's asking everybody questions, which is great. So, so it's good that we have 10 minutes for a few questions. And so, yes, and when, if you don't mind repeating the questions, so we'll record. Okay. Go ahead. Um, 
hostile. So the question is, how does uh, the data quality um, custodians, how do they integrate with this, this architecture? Um, we don't actually look at the data quality, um, to be honest. So it, we make it the, the particular business units, at, business units' responsibility to liaise with their data stewards and with their, their data governance to, to make sure that what they're looking at is actually of a certain quality. So when it comes to data quality, we, we make sure that we've got the platforms, like this is the enterprise gateway, this is productivity. It's up to you to have uh, responsible data usage um, in your particular business unit. Got it. Go ahead. Did you want to add something? No. An anything, anybody else? It's too early. <laughs> of course, you can now. Yes. The floor is yours. You can come on stage if you want. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, in, in our community, how did we manage the workload that, the workload that came through? And did we, how did, did we set up any idea of how fast we want to answer? Or when do, when do I allow the community to answer? And when do I step in to answer? So initial stages, yes, I was the only one answering all the questions. So I had like a 24-7 Teams job. And then the excitement, it's, it's kind of, I didn't have to do anything. The, the community wanted to start answering. So it was not all champions came, to, came on board to answer the questions. There was, say, four guys that was truly interested in Power BI. They helped me. Then what I started doing is as soon as somebody requests a Power BI license, in the initial stages, I got on a call with that person, explained Power BI licensing, and then explained the community idea. As soon as I see somebody's face light up around the idea to see that there's a platform to kind of show your worth, they bought in. So there was no formal SLA, we talk, I did not want to step into formal SLAs to say we need to give you an answer by a certain time. It, it, it's always a, as fast as possible so that we keep it a, a, a good environment to work in. So it's, it's like a, it's more community than it is a job, right? It's a it's, it's friendly environment. But, but, but we do have a couple of guys dedicated to please make sure you answer the questions. So it's not a, it's not you have to, but please can you just every day look if there are open questions. So we try and uh, on see at least that all the questions have been answered by the close of every day. And, and the nature, just to add, so we get the question on the team side. If I do not answer in a week, I get an email. If I don't answer the email, I get a Skype. Then he gets a phone Skype, call, a call, then they call his wife. <laughs> then <they're> like, <laughs> and then they come to your office. Yeah. And, and then <laughs> they call me, and then I tell them, yeah, go speak uh, with Tian. It's fine. I think what's really spectacular is I've never seen uh, an organization integrate the Legos like you do, between Teams and Power Apps and Flow and Form and Sway and Stream and, I don't know, things I didn't know you could do. And so there is a lot of components you can take, like Guy in the Cube channel and integrate it, pick the pieces. You don't have to create. There's a lot of stuff out there, and we have the components that enables you to make it look like it's super customized, uh, that it's part of your ecosystem and it flows naturally inside the framework you create. Like, when you open Teams, he's always going to the same place every time, just different channels. So I thought it was very interesting to see how 10, 15 people support 20,000. And I think you guys are super, super clever in, in using it. Um, any other questions? I can give you the microphone if you have another question. <laughs> no? That's it? No mas? Anything else? All right, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.